Tonight, the FCC questions all ISPs over network speeds, the big push for text to 911 from cell phone carriers, and why you should care about webmail encryption. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 147 for Friday, August 8th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Personal Capital. With Personal Capital, you'll finally have all your financial life in one place and get a clear view of everything you own. Best of all, it's free. To sign up, go to personalcapital.com slash TN2. Hello, everybody. I'm Sarah Lane reporting live from my dining room, and let's get right into our interview section of the show. I'm joined by Seth Rosenblatt, who's the senior writer over at News at CNET, who is reporting live from DEF CON. Hey, Seth. Hey, Sarah. How's it going? It's going really well. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we definitely wanted sure. to have you on to talk about security. Obviously, a big uh, week in security. We've got uh, Black Hat and DEF CON. They, they were overlapping yep. yesterday, and we're, 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 we're squarely in DEF CON now. So... What is, I, I, was, I was speaking with uh, security expert Steve Gibson uh, yesterday on the show, and I said, what's the big difference between the two? And he said, well, you know, it's really kind of a matter of preference. There is a lot of overlap in the subject matter. What is your take? Sure. Yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of overlap, not only in subject matter, but in attendees. Uh, I like to think of it sort of as a, as a mullet week. It's a business uh, at the beginning, and it's a party in the back. <laughs> All right, so what have you, what have you seen so far this week that's been surprising or something that at least on a consumer side you feel like is, is making inroads in, in security and, and how uh, security will be shaped in the future? Well, there have been a couple of interesting uh, uh, things to, uh, on display this week. Uh, one presenter talked about how easy it is to hack traffic lights. Um, we're getting an update uh, tomorrow on uh, car hacking. Um, and then uh, Yahoo uh, announced yesterday that they will be uh, working on a plan to encrypt the webmail end-to-end -end like Google. So uh, lots of things going on. Yeah, you know, you actually wrote an article uh, about this exact uh, subject. Yahoo teams up with Google on encrypted web mail, which had a mm -hmm. uh, question mark at the end. What is, what is the situation with this story? Why are the two companies teaming up? So this is, in my opinion, this is a long overdue uh, and very complicated problem. Uh, getting uh, email to be encrypted so that the metadata isn't broadcasted as it's sent is uh, very challenging. Uh, email was never designed to be a secure way of communicating. Um, so there's a lot of difficulties there, and it's hard to encrypt while maintaining uh, the proper level of service so that you don't think that uh, it's slower uh, and go use another service. Um, so it's very difficult. Uh, there are, I was talking with Phil Zimmerman today who invented PGP, which is used for encrypting email. Uh, he said that it was very encouraging that they're doing this, but, uh, you know, it's very ambitious that they want to get this done sometime next year. Let's put it that way. You know, we've been following the story of the Russian crime mob that apparently took mm -hmm. the largest amount of of, of personal data and user passwords that's yeah. at least known uh, on the internet. And there have been some conflicting reports as to whether this is actually as big of a deal as it sounded like initially. Uh, you, you actually wrote an article kind of in, in the latter camp saying, this is not necessarily as scary as hold security would, would have people believe. Why not? Yeah, so uh, the experts that I spoke to, uh, and I spoke with a very wide range of, of people with different backgrounds, all were pretty much on the same page. That is not something to panic about. Um, it's not clear at this point whether any uh, uh, financial information was involved in the records that were stolen. Um, it's possible, but those companies that are in charge of financial information, uh, like your bank, for example, um, they haven't been notified yet. And it's going to take several months before we find out if they were, uh, in fact, affected. It's possible uh, 420,000 domains were, were, you know, in this. But um, it, it also appears that this is information that was taken over a number of years. Uh, and one researcher I spoke to spends a lot of time investigating threats. 
uh, and data, large data breaches just like this said that you know, 100,000, uh, he sees 100,000 hacked domains in six months, um, and they're not all entirely new ones either. So 420,000, that could very easily be several years worth, and he said if that's the case, it's not, not, a, not such a huge deal. Uh, if it's 420,000 in, say, a week or a month, so then that's, a, that's something to be worried about, but that doesn't seem to be the case here. You know, before I let you go, Seth, because I know you're in the media room uh, and, uh, you know, it's loud and you're being a very good sport. I know you're not actually connected to us in a traditional way. You are on a black phone. Isn't that right? That's correct. I'm talking to you through uh, an encrypted tunnel, uh, through apps that come on the black phone by default. What do you think about it? Well, I, I'd like to hear what your, uh, you know, what the viewers think about it. Uh, for my end, it looks like the signal is pretty reasonable and not too pixelated. Um, but uh, and I'm actually surprised that you know, being a, at a DefCon, that no one's hacked the signal uh, yet. <laughs> That's not unusual around here. Yeah, no kidding. Well, we will let you go and enjoy DefCon. But thanks for joining us on TN2. Seth Rosenblatt is a senior writer at News in the News Department for CNET. Seth, let people know where they can keep up with your uh, your musings online. <laughs> I'm at uh, Seth R. S E T H R. And uh, thanks again, Sarah. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. All right, bye -bye. All right, coming up in just a moment, uh, George Takai, you know him. He's kind of the social media Star Trek guy, at least more than any of the other actors, uh, is going to get a medical exam from a smartphone. Sounds weird, but it's 100% true. But first, let's take a moment and thank Personal Capital for sponsoring this episode of Tech News Tonight. It's a free and secure tool that helps you not only manage your finances, but grow your wealth. That is something I've struggled with my entire life. How do I get richer? Well, you have to make good decisions. However, your money is probably spread around. You know, if you're like me, you might have some 401ks and there's a few different bank accounts and you're trying to figure out what the rates are and what's your interest. And it's kind of complicated. You've got a bunch of different sites. You have various usernames and passwords. If you're paying somebody to manage your money for you, well, they might not know what they're doing, but it's not free. Personal capital brings all of your accounts and all of your assets onto a single screen that can be accessed on your desktop computer, on your phone, on your tablet. This is all real-time graphs that are really intuitive as well. Personal Capital has an app, actually. It's a watch app. You can download it in Google Play Store. And it integrate with Personal Capital on other Android devices. So as a user, you've got updates on your finances wherever you are. You know, watch app. Personal Capital shows you how much you're overpaying in fees, no matter how uh, you, are, you are hitting the information, and how to reduce those fees. You know, it's not enough to know that you're paying an annual $50 fee. Let's get rid of it. You also get tailored advice on optimizing your investment based on who you are. So don't wait. Signing up takes just a minute and it will pay big dividends. Personal capital gives you total clarity and transparency and you can make better investment decisions right away. To set up your free account, free account, go to personalcapital.com slash TN2, TN and the number two. Personal capital is free and it's the smart way to grow your money and we thank Personal Capital for their support of Tech News Tonight. And now, let's hit the tech feed, shall we? Today, the FCC voted to adopt rules that require all U.S. carriers and some app developers to implement support for text to 911 services by the end of the year, 2014. Major carriers already allow Americans to text 911 where it's available, but smaller carriers will have to comply by this new deadline. And they'll also have to rely on emergency response centers to deploy the infrastructure necessary to receive emergency texts. The FCC says more than 100 911 call centers are already accepting emergency texts, but that only covers portions of 16 states, although all of Vermont and Maine, I guess they're special. The requirements also apply to interconnected text messaging providers. That would be something like Apple's iMessage, where users can use their phone number over iMessage. But apps like Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp 
may not face the same requirements, at least not now. It's also not really a hard deadline. Once the year ends, carriers and app devs will have six months to implement text to 911 support when asked to do so by any 911 call center. FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler announced today that he's asking all large U.S. wireless carriers to explain exactly how they decide when to slow down download speeds for some customers. After specifically questioning number one U.S. carrier Verizon Wireless about its plan to throttle customers on unlimited data plans after October 1st. Verizon has defended the practice. They call it a narrow, widely accepted and lawful way to manage their networks. Wheeler told reporters that, quote, all the kids do it was never something that worked for me when I was growing up. My concern in this instance, and it's not just with Verizon, by the way, we've written to all the carriers, is that it's moving from a technology and engineering issue to a business issue, such as choosing between different subscribers based on your economic relationship with them. Some breaking news for a Friday, U.S. Just District Judge Lucy Koh has struck down a $324 million settlement that was reached between most of the class, class action plaintiffs and defendants in an ongoing Silicon Valley wage theft antitrust lawsuit involving Apple, Google, Intel, and Adobe. Judge Koh writes, quote, this court has lived with this case for nearly three years. And during that time, the court has reviewed a significant number of documents in adjudicate, adjudicate, ah, that's the first time I've ever said that word out loud. Adjuice, adjudicating. Anyway, you know what I mean. Not only the substantive motions, but also the voluminous ceiling requests. Having done so, the court cannot conclude that the instant settlement falls within the range of reasonableness. Obviously, I should never play a judge for Halloween. Judge Coe says that she bases her rejection by comparing the $324 million settlement sum to a settlement back in 2013 with three other defendants in the wage theft lawsuit, Intuit, Lucasfilm, and Pixar. Remember that? Coe argues that the settlement figure should have been at least $380 million. Case might go to court now. Following a Bloomberg report that some Apple products such as iPads and MacBooks had been banned by the Chinese government for procurement lists due to security concerns, the Central Government Procurement Center, as well as the Finance Ministry, says, well, Apple never applied to be on that list in the first place. Quote, even though Apple has the certification for energy-saving products, it has never provided the necessary verification material and agreements according to the regulations, said a finance ministry fax sent to Reuters last night. Chinese regulators did recently launch an anti-monopoly probe into Microsoft after China said in May it would also ban Microsoft's Windows 8 OS. The Central Procurement Agency did recently delist foreign antivirus software vendors Symantec and Kapersky Lab due to security concerns, according to the state-run Xinhua News Agency. But apparently, China says Apple, it never, it never happened. AdAge reports that Google is set to begin testing a new method of targeting tablet and smartphone users that connects the separate tracking mechanisms that follow what people do on mobile devices and in mobile apps, respectively, they're citing people familiar with the matter over at AdAge. The targeting method relies on Google's 2 million plus network of third party sites and its mobile app network AdMob, which is able to track and serve ads to users on hundreds of thousands of mobile apps across Apple's iOS and Google's Android mobile OSs. Google's also making some ad moves in music as well. And it's testing something called Listen Now ads with Spotify, Rhapsody, and Apple's recently acquired Beats Music. Users can search for the name of a musical artist, and Google will then display ads. They're grouped together under a Listen Now label, which promote music services, including Google's own Google Play. Music services previously could have bought ads like this, but the grouping and the display and the labeling, all new. Facebook made some changes to its platform policies that probably aren't going to be liked by some app creators because it stops app creators from asking users to like their page in order to view things like special videos or win prizes or other giveaways. The policy change means that Facebook linked apps will have to get people to like them, you know, because they like them, not because 
they've been monetarily incentivized to or otherwise. The ban on like incentives for app pages goes into effect on November 5th. Developers can still give incentives for other behaviors, such as logging in with their Facebook account or checking into a store location on Facebook. They can also offer promotions and contests. They just can't ask users to like a page in order to participate in them. I mentioned Star Trek, uh, Star Trek star and internet darling. He really is one. You follow him on Twitter, George Chikai. He's, he's a lot of fun. He starred in a recent YouTube video where he receives a full physical exam given by a doctor with a smartphone. This is this is 100% real. Takai talks to all the innovators in the video who are creating biotechnology and gets a full exam using just a smartphone and a few extra accessories. He's testing a electrocardiogram device that uses your iPhone case to measure your heart rate, for example, an iPhone attachment that can take pictures of your inner eardrum to make sure you don't have damaged hearing, and an ultrasound device that checks your arteries for clogging. I hope uh, George is feeling uh, nice and healthy after that. And that is it for this Friday edition of Tech News Tonight, which I usually do not do. So thanks, everybody, for, uh, for, for being part of this little experiment. Never done this from home before. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write us at TN2 at twit.tv with questions, comments, or general feedback. And don't miss Tech News today. That's Monday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. I'm Sarah Lane. Thanks for watching. And happy Friday. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.